It's rare for a cartoon character to age alongside its audience, but Ben 10 was a unique exception. As the series evolved, so did the characters, and even the Omnitrix. I don't recognize any of these guys. Although under the circumstances, this one looks pretty good. <laughs> Alien Force, the sequel to the original series, debuted it shortly after its conclusion to resonate with its maturing audience. Alien Force adopted a darker and more ominous atmosphere, showcasing an older and more mature Ben 10 and introducing a new Omnitrix with a diverse set of fresh new aliens, each as iconic as the ones from the original show. Interestingly, early concepts of Alien Force suggested it could have been much more unsettling and visually intense. What a time as any to give this one a try. While the original Ben 10 was still airing, Cartoon Network would approach Glenn Murakami to develop a new revamp of the Ben 10 series. Glenn Murakami would bring on the writer Dwayne McDuffie and together with the help of Cartoon Network, they'd begin brainstorming how this new series would be like. Now despite Cartoon Network giving the two large amounts of freedom to develop the series, they still offered their own suggestions for elements they wanted to see in the show, despite the network offering notes on the direction of the series. Dwayne and Glenn still got to incorporate their own ideas. Since the characters were older, this new Benton series would take on a more mature tone, but also a new narrative approach. If the original Ben 10 was essentially a summer road trip series, then this new Ben 10 was more similar to works like The X-Files, The Twilight Zone, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In fact, Glenn Murakami wanted the series to be mystery focused, exploring a group of teenagers taking on a mysterious faction of aliens and other ominous forces. This new tonal and stylistic shift didn't only affect the story, but also the alien forms as well, as Glenn Murakami viewed Ben's transformations as more ominous than heroic. But to me, I'm like, it didn't make sense to me that Ben was a superhero. Hmm. He's got this watch and he could turn into aliens. But that's not necessarily superpowers. That's a little bit... He's turning into monsters, kind of. So when I get back, punish me however you want. But right now, I have a friend who's in trouble. This new envisioning of the aliens is perhaps why they had a very particular look early on in the show's development. Artist Eric Kniet developed these concepts, and as you can see, every alien present takes on a more grotesque and horrific appearance. The aliens have a semblance of animals present in our world. However, they look almost mutated, like their forms have become spliced and distorted, with many eyes and limbs sprouting outwards, making them look like a grotesque lab experiment. Fish-like creatures now walk on all fours, with their body parts elongated and their teeth becoming sharp and jagged, growing in areas they were never meant to. Insect-like creatures become larger than expected, with their biological features now becoming deadly weapons, and the inner workings of their bodies are now exposed through the translucent skin. Mammals now appear more lethal and grotesque and in some concepts have a series of other limbs growing all over their bodies. And in some instances, insectoid-like forms emerge as if they're some kind of tumor, and some even look Lovecraftian. You might be wondering why Eric Kniet would create concepts that look horrific and disgusting. Sure, Alien Force was made for a maturing audience, but the targeted demographic was still children at the end of the day. Well, that was the point. You see, Eric Kniet created all these illustrations knowing they'd never be approved. 
The point was to not make looks that would look cool as merchandise. The purpose behind these looks was to make something that no one had ever seen before, knowing they'd be rejected. When Murakami and McDuffie were creating the aliens for Alien Force, they did not want to repeat the same type of aliens present in the original series. They followed a unique method to create the new aliens we'd see in the series, by either putting a twist on a pre-existing alien, like how Chroma Stone is Diamond Head with rainbow colors, with the ability to shoot out energy. Even more unique, they combined aliens from the original series to create entirely new ones. Heat Blast and Wild Vine were combined to develop Swamp Fire. Ghost Freak and presumably Artaguana became big chill, so they had a good grasp of how the 10 aliens would look. Although some of Eric Knight's initial designs were a bit too creepy early on, his contributions were still significant early in the show's development. You can see this with some of his designs for the later aliens. Some concepts look pretty similar to how they look in the final series. Aliens like Chroma Stone maintain a lanky body, lack of facial features, and grow crystals all over, but with a slightly more creative approach to their form, like floating body parts. Big, chill, essentially looks very identical to his final form. The only significant difference is that the concept illustrations take on a taller, lanky form, with the folding cape enveloping the entire body all the way to the ground. This approach to Big Chill's design makes him appear more ghostly, at least significantly more than what we see in the final show. Echo, Echo keeps the same general body language, but with a few differences. Their bodies are much smaller, and strangely, they look like they take on a more fleshy form as they look organic, likely because of their color. Glenn Murakami would later come in to flesh out the look of Echo Echo, which eventually helped the alien take on its iconic appearance. Not every alien we see, however, remotely resemble the one we see in the final show, and deviate more heavily. Swamp Fire, one of Ben's most famous aliens, went through a lot of design evolutions. Swamp Fire takes on a green yeti-like form. You can see the fur covering parts of his body. He wears a suit of green armor of some kind, which appears skeletal at the waist. The creature's physical body is green and black, with a strange green orb located at the palms and chest, which is likely what would allow the fire to be shot out. There were countless revamps of Swamp Fire's look. This illustration by Glenn Wong makes Swamp Fire appear like a living piece of tree bark, as if he were Groot. And with the red sections underneath his wooden form, it seems like there's fire generating inside the body. Since Murakami and McDuffie were fans of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, you can tell that the character did influence the look. Much like the name implies, Jet Ray looks like an abnormal manta ray. Brainstorm takes on the same overall crab-like look, with the artists experimenting with different crab-like bodies. Some are based on ones in our world, but others have more unique forms. Eventually ending up at the Brainstorm we see in the final show. <laughs> was an interesting character during the early development of the series. He was spun out of the creator's wish to have another strong alien Ben could turn into. He was not a revamp of a pre-existing alien or a combination of two either. He was completely separate and to create him, Murakami and Dwayne McDuffie decided that a dinosaur would be the perfect creature to base it on. Since there are so many types of dinosaurs, Humongosaur was still an alien. His designs must have been challenging. It's hard to say which dinosaurs the initial concepts were based on, with one of the illustrations looking more like a bear. Wait, is Humongosaur supposed to be a sauropod? Okay, I guess he's a sauropod. That's just my headcanon. Oh shoot, 
Glenn Wong, Glenn Murakami, and Eric Kinnit are what you'd call generational. They took on the challenge of reimagining an iconic series for a new generation, and I think it's safe to say that they managed to create a new, legendary series. Music